thank you so much for joining us. Uh, today we have a very exciting webinar in store for you. Uh, beginning, I'll begin and tell you, my name is Brian Rosenberg. I'm the founder of Gays with Kids. Uh, about seven, uh, six months ago, um, we decided to launch a webinar series, you know, Gays with Kids since our launch, actually it'll be seven years ago in March. Um, we've done, I think, a, we've done a lot of storytelling, sharing sort of anecdotally stories from, from dads who, you know, talked about how they became dads. But we didn't really go in and give you the details. We didn't really work it out with the, with the partners and what those relationships look like and all that's involved. And that all changed last year. Um, and we launched a webinar series on how to become a dad, really to help make sure we're getting the word out to more people to help you um, really understand what all that's involved and then to walk with you through each step of the way. Um, today is the first webinar that we're doing where we actually got dads, Heath and Carlos, you can see, and hopefully we'll be able to get a cameo appearance from their son, Jackson, uh, who are going to talk, tell us, share their story. And then alongside with them, we'll have their primary family building partners. So we're very excited for this. I hope that you get a lot of value out of this. Uh, a couple of logistical things. Number one is do not, uh, do not hold back on any questions. Um, you can use either the chat function or the q and I have them both in front of me and I know how to use them. So we're ready to help out with that. Um, and with that, let's get. So I'd like to start by saying, so I should say, first of all, I'm a dad. Um, my husband and I created our family through a combination of adoption and surrogacy. And so when I tell you that the secret to success in becoming dads, regardless of what path, uh, you choose is really selecting the right family building partners. And there are two critically important considerations for this. Number one, experience. You must, must, must work with family building partners who under, who've got a long and proven track record um, with great success um, and who really are at the, at the you know, leading edge of the, of the industry. The second part of that though, that I think gets left out and is not mentioned as often as it should be, is they must also have a passion for working with the LGBT community. And I can tell you, we, we launched a program called Partners to Fatherhood. And it's just with a few organizations because I know there are so many organizations out there right now, it's, it's confusing and we want to help you decide which organizations to partner with. And I can tell you that every one of the organizations that you'll meet through Gays with Kids is just as passionate about helping gay, bi, and trans men become dads as I am. So um, just please keep that in mind. If you forget everything else, just remember that's really a critical part, again, no matter what path you follow. All right, so uh, alongside myself, as I said, we've got Keith and Carlos, who are dads of uh, Feeling Young Son. Um, Next to him, we've got Dr. Guy Ringler. He's a partner of California Fertility Partners. You know, based on what I was saying before about experience and passion, Dr. Ringler is one of the first IVF clinics to help gay men become dads uh, and to have babies. And now these babies, I mean, they are adults. And as I understand it, Dr. Ringler, some will come back to you to ask for help for them to become dads. Uh, the next to, to Dr. Ringler are Jay and Danny Cook Wong. Um, the founders of co-founders of Same Love Surrogacy and Same Love Surrogacy, they came from a personal experience, the experience of three gay dads who created their families via surrogacy and uh, egg donation and a four-time surrogate involved in international and domestic uh, uh, surrogacy. So we've got, um, with that being said, I'd like to just get started right away and let Keith and Carlos share their story. Again, if you have any questions, please do not hesitate to use the chat function or the Q&A. You can't see it, but I'm pointing to those boxes on my screen right now. All right. So Heath and Carlos, thank you so much. Um, we're ready to hear, hear what you guys have to share with us. Great. Hold on, we have costume changes. We're yeah. gonna get the music queued up. We're gonna, no, let's get it. Wow. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, yes, guys, you've entered into the next dimension. Um, so I'm Heath. This is Carlos. Um, I thank you guys for having us on today. We are big advocates for sharing our story. Um, we like to, you know, just share our own personal journey with the hopes that 
it helps other people as they're trying to decide how they want to form their own families. Um, and I feel like just by sharing that, hopefully that information leads you to maybe something you didn't know or something you want to know more about. So we're happy for any questions you have coming our way, but I think we'll start off by just kind of talking a little bit about ourselves, how we met, all that jazz, you know, you can get to know us, right? So I'm originally from Kentucky, born and raised. I sometimes have a Southern accent when I'm tired and drunk, but otherwise it's not there. So, and then Carlos. I'm originally from LA. Um, so I don't know if I have a California accent or not, but uh, we met in uh, New York uh, about almost 12 years ago. Yeah, so we've been together over 11 years now. Um, we met. I guess we both moved to New York for various reasons, both kind of theatrical related, uh, directing, actor, all that jazz as people move there for. Um, but I also got really heavily involved in activism for marriage equality whenever we first moved to New York. And a mutual friend of ours is kind of how we met. Carlos likes to tell the story, so feel free. Well, I <laughs> had just gotten to my roommate's uh, apartment and or our apartment, I should say, um, after working a very grueling shift as a toy soldier at FAO Schwartz as one does in New York City and I walked in and I saw this cute boy on the couch. I uh, had, see the long hair over there in the photo? Hair. It was even longer than that. It was like down to my shoulders. And um, I, I thought to myself, well, I definitely need to sit next to him at dinner. And that's really kind of what picked it off. And um, we started talking. And so we met kind of in an old fashioned way, not I think if, you know, back then apps weren't as prevalent. I think we would have met on the apps if not before then, <laughs> but- But uh, we met at a dinner party. We met at a dinner party. <laughs> um, so for us, whenever we met, I think a very important part for us was just, we knew we wanted to have a family. We didn't know how we wanted to get there, but we knew we were young. We didn't feel like we needed to necessarily rush into figuring out what that, that sort of, how it set itself up, but it is something I think we always knew that we wanted to do. I yeah, and I think that's actually kind of good advice already to kind of share is start talking about it with your partner early on. You know, maybe there's people that are watching that aren't even um, in a relationship yet, but they want to be parents. And I think that it's really important to bring that up because it is well, important to know if that person you're with is on that same journey with you. And I think communication is key on that. I hear so many people that get four years of a relationship and all of a sudden they realize they don't align on kids. I was like, I don't think you were talking for the last four years then. <laughs> um, so that's just yeah. me. Um, but I know that for Carlos, he also wanted a family because he he loves the idea of being a grandparent. I'm, I'm excited <laughs> to be a dad, obviously, but I'm really excited to be a grandpa. <laughs> like I, I already know I want to be called Pops. I think it'll be awesome. And uh uh, it just growing uh, our our family in in that direction has just been really a, a dream come true for us. Now, granted, that is kind of forcing the fact that our child we want them to have children. So if he chooses not to have children, that's fine. Uh, <laughs> we're okay with that too. Um, but I think obviously when we enter into it as gay men, we have a lot of various options for how we can form our families. Um, personally, we looked into all of them because. I am a type A control freak kind of, let's figure out everything, let's figure out all the endings and how they're gonna end. Um, and so my mother was adopted. So we spent a lot of time looking at adoption out of respect to her. Um, ultimately, I think for us personally, um, again, I'm risk averse. So I just felt like for me with adoption, there were too many opening myself up to too many endings like a through z like and there was a lot of emotional risk i felt like that could happen all the way to the end for us so for me choosing surrogacy had a lot to do with the fact that whilst there are question marks in anyone's journey i felt like there were perhaps fewer question marks and a little bit more that i could have a hand in controlling and deciding, right? So I liked it because of that. For Carlos, I know that he had other like aspects. So he's an only child. Right, for for me, you know, it, it really kind of overwhelming when you think about, okay, well, how do I even start? And I think for us, it started really literally with me going into Google and putting in, you know, <laughs> gay dad and seeing what comes up. Uh, but, Add a couple more letters and everything. Yeah, don't put in gay daddy. You might get yeah, something else. Get but, um, <laughs> uh, I also searched that, but that's a whole other story. Um, so, uh, but what was great is I started to see and find and share with, we, we started sharing with each other um, places like Gays with Kids, 
um, places uh, like Men Having Babies that helped us with their GPAC program that have a great collection of, of resources and um, agencies and clinics that they recommend. And even more so an introduction to this great community that now, you know, all of you who are watching are a part of um, because ultimately we're helping to build each other up and, um, and learn from each other. Yeah, and I think he hit on something that was very vital in our journey, which was the GPAP program. Uh, so I don't know if everyone's familiar, but Men Having Babies has a program where they provide, it's an acronym for Gay Parenting Assistance Program. And I would love to live in a world where surrogacy was uh, a financially optional choice for us. But at that point in our lives, we didn't have the financial resources that we needed to go on a full journey. Um, so the GPAP program really helped us uh, achieve that journey for us because you know we it reduced the amount of time uh, of that dream happening much quicker for sure right so I mean for sure that is a very you know important part of our process but um speaking of process I guess um I guess we'll tell you a little bit about kind of what our journey looked like, um, ups and downs, all the bumps, all the positive moments. Um, we, we are very fortunate. We feel like we had a, a very good journey, right? We know that obviously everyone has hurdles and bumps, um, but, but for us, I feel like, you know, we'll go a little bit more into that. But uh, the first thing, obviously, that's fun right off the bat, because this is how everyone's journey starts, is you're choosing your egg donor. And for us, you kind of have to take it a little lightly um, because, you know, it, it is a big choice, but at the same time, there is some, you know, humor in how we're going about selecting from profiles and things. We were fortunate enough to be able to actually get to do a, a, a call with our a Zoom call. Well, it wasn't Zoom at the time. It was Skype because Zoom hadn't had its moment yet. Um, we did a Skype call with our donor and we really got to know her that way. But how we went about selecting our donor, I feel like it's, kind of unique. Yeah. Carlos was going there's so on. Many, yeah. yeah, there's so many different things that you're looking for and certain things that, you know, each of us as individuals were thinking were important. And of course we discussed those and talked about them, but well, the way we did it was we didn't actually look at them together. We looked at through the, the egg donor uh, database separately and we did a top six for ourselves Individually. Individually. Because the agency, Same Love, had asked us to come back with the top three, right? Uh, so we felt like, okay, if we each choose six and see if we align on three, which, which, ones, which ones overlap? <laughs> right. And so, so that's kind of how we went about choosing our egg donor. Uh, so we aligned on three of them. We met with them. And ultimately, we, we selected our first egg donor. And I'd say that was where our first hurdle, I guess, was in it. Sometimes you select an egg donor and unfortunately they just have lower AMH levels, right? So at the time we had our egg donor go to Dr. Ringler and had her do her in-person evaluation because her hormone levels were like right on the cusp. Um, but ultimately we determined that because we are two sperm donors, um, we were only probably gonna retrieve enough eggs to be successful for like an individual sperm donor. And so ultimately we had to then kind of go back Back and go back to the drawing board and find another egg donor that would function for us needing to split ours. And what I will say though is with every hurdle, I'm a big believer of everything happens for a reason. And our the egg donor that um, we did move forward with is such an amazing woman. And obviously not just because of, of the gift that she gave us, but we've actually become friends with her and we stay in touch. And um, that has been, it, it was absolutely meant to be her, right. I guess, is kind of what I'm, I'm getting at. And really, it's the same with our surrogate. You know, we've been so lucky to have such an amazing uh, village of people that have helped us um, create our family. And our surrogate is just as incredible. And I, you know, when we met her, it was very quickly a, a connection between all of us, not only on, on what we like to watch on TV, but also, you know, on what we wanted to to do moving forward and how she could help and communicate with us. And so she was, uh, they, they were all a dream, which was amazing for us. Yeah, and I think that for us, a little bit of a unique aspect, and I think this is important for anybody who's going on a journey, is that your journey can kind of take place in a lot of different shapes, right? We were living in New York City at the time. We now currently live in Los Angeles. Our clinic was in LA, our agency was in LA. Turned out that our egg donor that we found also happened to be on the West Coast and so did our surrogate. 
we could have found a surrogate in Texas. The reality is you can go about it in many different ways. Just because you're located on the West Coast doesn't mean you that. If you could be on the East Coast and still use, as we did, Same Love and uh, California, Fertility Partners. So I think that's an important thing to kind of understand about the journey as you go on it. Your location is probably the least significant part. Um, so, um, but I think that he, saw, he hit on it. We had really good relationships with our egg donor and our surrogate. That was important to us. Um, we enter into it, we're personality driven people if you haven't figured it out yet. Um, so we wanted to find people that we connected with and we did. And so we're grateful for that. We have great relationships, pretty unique. We have gone out to drinks with our egg donor. We have met our egg donor's mother. She follows us on Instagram. We're, we, we're, we're, we're a bit of an exception to the egg donor rule. Um, and then with our surrogate, she's got four kids of her own. We love them all. We all hang out when we can, obviously a little restricted because of COVID, um, but it's been great. So our, we, we, in terms of journey, once we found our surrogate, obviously we did the transfer and we were, very lucky. We were pregnant on our first transfer. So we definitely, you know, we're obviously holding our breath. And I am a bit more, uh, I'm not the optimist in the relationship, Carlos yeah, is. He's the realist and I'm, I'm definitely the dreamer. So we were, I was actually in Germany for work and he came out uh, on the day of the transfer. And we went out and we went to the castle, uh, Neuschwanstein castle, the one that Disneyland's castle is modeled after. And I was like, this is a sign. This is gonna, it's gonna work because our dreams are coming true. You know, cue the birds and uh, the, the deer coming to uh, celebrate with us. Um, and, but we, it was successful, which was amazing. And I think that was a huge part obviously with, because of Dr. Ringler's guidance in prepping um, our surrogate to have, to be ready to receive the, the, the transfer, which is a big part. And then we, we kind of had a good journey. Like we communicated really well with our surrogate. Again, we were friendly. We'd gone bowling with the kids. We'd gone to amusement parks with the kids. We'd done all that. Um, so then of course, to kind of summarize it and speed it up nine months at that point, we also had a very fun delivery story as well. Um, and we, we were scheduled, she was scheduled, our son was scheduled to be born. At the time we didn't know gender because my sister had had four kids and never figured out any of them. So I said, well, I guess I can do it for one. Um, so we did. And he was scheduled to be born on March 19th. He ended up with an early inducement date of March 12th. So we said, ah, we'll get to LA 10 days early. We'll be fine. Great. We landed. And then we are the kind that actually turn off our phone when we're actually on the plane, not because we think the plane's going to crash if we don't, but because we just, you know, we follow the rules. We're follow we're rule followers. Followers. Um, and we turn them on. And we had a ton of text messages from our surrogate and her husband saying, hey, uh, you guys need to get to the hospital. So, so we literally hopped in the car from LAX and drove straight to uh, the delivery room. And um, luckily, you know, everything went smoothly. It took quite a few hours. So it gave us enough time to get down there. Yeah. And this was uh, right before uh, COVID. So uh, he was born March 3rd and uh, which was about a week before everything really started to lock down. And so we were able to be in the delivery room, which was just amazing and incredible and tears. And actually just thinking about it gets me a little bit emotional. Um, and exactly that kind of, of, of picture perfect moment that I you know, could have only hoped for, but didn't, didn't expect surprisingly and I'm the one who usually expects that kind of stuff but um, you know you just never know you have to you, as much as I, I say I'm a dreamer you do have to be realistic about the serious uh, things that are happening in childbirth. Yeah no it's true um, so I think like that's our journey we have an awesome son he giggles a lot he laughs a lot and if if he wakes up from his nap we'll show you him he's really yeah. cute <laughs> um, but I think one of the other things I guess I'd like to hit on is like obviously everyone's coming here. They're perhaps trying to figure out, okay, where, where do I go from here? What steps do I take? Who do I work with? Because the reality is you Google search and you're gonna find a lot of content. Um, but we ultimately landed on Same Love Surrogacy in California Fertility Partners for a couple of reasons. And for us, um, obviously as gay men, we kind of, it's the gay bar theory, right? Um, why do we go to the gay bar, right? When we go, oh, there's tons of straight bars out there, but we like going to the gay bar. Um, it's this idea of just being around people with shared experience. And so we really wanted to find people who were part of the LGBT family and, and really had that going for them. Because for us, 
I mean, it, it's just like anybody. You want somebody on your side who fully understands what position you're in. So for same love surrogacy, it was like a no brainer. It's run by gay fathers who are intended parents themselves who had gone through the process and who had, you know, done this. And so they knew when we were in certain situations that, oh, I, I can go to them for advice and they're gonna get 100% my side of it, right? Because they themselves, not only are they men in the process, which again, in any pregnancy is secondary. That's just the reality of it. But they're also gay men, which, kind of is another set down yeah. in terms of that. So for us, we wanted whenever we were like, what's happening here? For us, the biggest thing was the transition from the clinic, which Dr. Ringler gave us great care to the OB's office. The OB gave the surrogate great care, but all of a sudden- It, it becomes about the surrogate, you know, and, and, you know, not trying to out Jay and Danny and Dr. Ringler here, but <laughs> what- They're <gay>. what, what, <laughs> what, what was really wonderful for us is just that comfortability factor of being able to be completely honest with them about our fears and our hopes and all of those and know that they would completely understand it in, in the unique way that someone who's lived a gay or LGBT experience um, understands and views the world. Um, so that was, was what I think was so amazing. And what I will say is all of them respond so quickly too, because when that transition happened from uh, uh, to the OB, I, which I was not ready for because yeah. I wanted us to be able to FaceTime in and it, some technical issues happened and then the, we, the appointment was over. I sent a, I'm not the, the, the type A personality that Heath is, but I sent a strongly worded email trying to understand, to, you know, and I, to, uh, to same love. And immediately they were on the phone being like, this is normal. This is all part of the process. It's not about you anymore. And I'm like, okay, you're right. Get it's, over yourself. It's not about me. It's, <laughs> it's uh, you know, it's about obviously making sure that your surrogate, surrogate yeah. is taken care of and that the baby is healthy. And, and uh, to the point of why California Fertility Partners for us, obviously we wanted somebody who works in partnership as well with Same Love. And we knew that they had a really great working relationship, but I also did all my research and looked at statistics and all that stuff. And I saw, oh, California Fertility Partners, they got some really good statistics. And then we met with Dr. Ringler and he's super nice. I mean, we are up here on the scale of energy and Dr. Ringler was nice in the middle, which we appreciated because <laughs> I don't think there's enough space in the room for another person like me. Um, so also he draws a really awesome diagram. If you work with him, you're gonna know what I mean. He has a nice little diagram that breaks down how eggs split, then the embryos, all of that. So- And that uh, was, we were really kind yeah. of thirsty for that knowledge, yeah. you know? We, we wanted to be educated along the way and to know really what was happening and what the processes were. And everyone involved was just so helpful in doing so and patient in doing so. Yeah, and I think that Dr. Ringler's team is great. He's got a great staff. They were really great at communicating with us. And so we were able to get information from them. We, we basically are, and I don't encourage everyone to be this way, but we were very hands-on and very inquisitive. Yeah. They, they, might, they might say differently about and us. Uh, <laughs> yes, they might have different opinions about exactly. us. Um, but the truth be told, I guess it led to something because uh, throughout this process, I guess I asked enough questions to Same Love, especially because I, shocker, guess what? I now work for Same Love Surrogacy, ah, disclosure. Um, but it's true, right? Obviously, if I didn't have a great experience, I wouldn't go work there. I also have several cases with Dr. Ringler right now. If I didn't have a great experience there, I wouldn't help refer clients over to him, right? Like that's the truth of the matter. If we didn't have a good experience, this is not the world in which I would be working, right? So I, um, I think that that speaks volumes as to the service that they provided us and the service that I know that they provide to the intended parents that I work with. So um, that's, we've gone over our time. We have a stopwatch over here, but you'll quickly learn that we don't respect that. So we will relinquish the rest of our time or whatever they say in the Senate, <laughs> we, we yeah. give our time back. So feel free to, to go on. So thanks guys. Thank you guys, that was great. Um, again, we're looking forward to a cameo appearance of Jackson later on. Um, in a second, I'm going to put uh, a link in the chat function, uh, excuse me, in the, in the chat function for everybody. You can actually read uh, Heath and Kyle's story on Gays with Kids, and it's, uh, it's a fun story to read. All right, so next up, again, I mentioned Dr. Guy Ringler earlier, so 
I'll let you speak for yourself, uh, Guy. Thank you again for joining us. We really appreciate uh, you being here. Do you mind giving us just a little bit of background first? Sure, absolutely. Wow, what a presentation, Keith and Harlow's. That was amazing. Thank you for sharing your story. But you know, it's funny. I don't think I've ever heard my clinic being related to a gay bar. <laughs> I guess that's a good thing. I mean, maybe we need to, to turn down the music a little bit in the lobby. <laughs> Not to get too raunchy, but some things happen in both I places so, sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> You're absolutely right. So um, anyway, so my name is Guy Ringler, and you know I have the best job in the world. I get to make young men dads like Keith, Keith and Carlos. And um, I feel fortunate to be in that position, you know, to be able to apply everything I've learned over the years and in um, undergrad medical school, postgraduate training to practice in reproductive medicine where we can help people um, make their dreams come true. And, it, and it's not hokey at all because that's really what we try to do. And we try to do it smoothly, effortlessly, um, uh, to, to make it happen right away. Um, so I've been practicing here for 30 years and I've been helping gay men to have babies for over 20 years. It's hard to believe it's been that long, but it has. And it's still as exciting today as it was with the first couple over 20 years ago. Um, young gay men today, I'm calling everyone young. I'm sounding old, I'm feeling <laughs> old, I guess. <laughs> have so many more resources available to them, like gays with kids, um, um, men having babies, um, wonderful egg donor agencies, incredible surrogacy agencies like Save Love Surrogacies. You know, 20 years ago, they were, they were not this level of resources. So there's abundant resources. There's, there's great clinics, great surrogacy agencies. Um, so be sure to, to talk to several people and select the group that you feel most comfortable work with. I've been working with Same Love Surrogacy since they started. Um, Jay, how many years ago was that? Five or six years? Um, yeah, six years ago, going on seven. Okay, you know, I admire their, their passion for helping gay men have babies. Um, their commitment to doing the right thing and their overall professionalism. Um, so we work to get together as a team, there's constant communication and we all have fun, you know, helping our patients to have babies and build families. So let's, I'm just gonna talk a little bit of what we do on the medical side to make this happen. And um, in general, I break it down into to five simple steps and we won't go into all the details. But one of the first things you should do is to have your sperm count checked. Um, the test is called a semen analysis. You can do it with your primary care physician or um, with an IVF clinic because you want to get a sense of the quantity and quality of your sperm because if there's an abnormality, then there's treatments that may help improve your numbers prior to freezing your sperm. Now for most men, we'll use frozen sperm for the process. Um, the only men I ask for fresh sperm on are men with extremely low sperm numbers. So that's less than 5% of the population. So by doing your baseline analysis, you'll know whether or not you can go ahead and freeze your sperm for the process. The day that you freeze sperm, we'll do all the FDA required infectious disease screening. And so we know that sample is FDA cleared to create the embryos. You'll also have genetic carrier screening to see if you have any mutations for genetic disease. And you're gonna want this information before you make a final uh, commitment to your egg donor in the process. Step number two is selection of the egg donor. And I love that Heath and Carlo um, had the opportunity to meet their donor. Some donors are willing to meet, I'd say about 50%. Others prefer to be anonymous and some of my um, tenant parents prefer to be anonymous. But if you have the opportunity to meet them, um, then they become part of your children's story. And so your children will know from a young age you know, how they were created and who helped create them. Once the donor is selected, she undergoes her medical screening and she will have a blood test called AMH, anti-malaria hormone. And that's helpful for for me because it predicts how many eggs she'll make in the treatment process. I always wanna make sure she's gonna make 
make sure she's going to make enough eggs to give us enough embryos to be successful. Um, most of the medical costs in this process um, are in creating embryos. It doesn't matter if we create two or 20. So it's better off creating more embryos. You have multiple attempts at a pregnancy or embryos for future transfers. In terms of egg donors, you can find whatever you're looking for in terms of hair color, eye color, educational background. So I always advise my patients, never settle. Wait until you find that special donor that's um, going to be um, right for you and your, and your family. Um, you don't settle when you choose your spouse. You should not settle, just settle when, when you're selecting your egg donor. Once the egg donor is medically screened, go to step three, which is to create embryos for freezing. And this is the fun part for me. This is in this process, the, I give the egg donor daily injections of hormones that stimulate the development of all the eggs that she's recruited for that month. So if she has a high AMH level, she's going to recruit a larger number of eggs, and we're going to st stimulate the development of all of those to maturity. So we override the natural menstrual cycle that selects that one. My goal is to retrieve between 20 and 30 eggs. The day of egg retrieval will thaw a vial of sperm or two if we have, have two partners. We'll inseminate the eggs with each sperm pr provider. The next day, which is day one of culture, we look for signs of fertilization and we expect about 75% of the mature eggs to fertilize. So on that day, it's a fertilized egg or one cell embryo. The next phase in IVF is we keep them undisturbed, undisturbed in the laboratory until day six. In between day one and day five to day six, about 60% of those one cell embryos will grow into a hundred cell embryo called a blastocyst. And this, this is important because this is de the developmental stage an embryo must reach if it's going to implant to start a pregnancy. So once it becomes a blastocyst, we can freeze it directly or oftentimes we'll do genetic testing on it. So when we do genetic testing, the embryologists are gonna biopsy three to five cells from the outer layer of the embryo and then freeze the embryo and the cells go to the genetics lab and they're gonna tell us whether or not that embryo contains the correct number of chromosomes. What we find in a 25 year old egg donor population is about 30 to 40% of those embryos will be abnormal, 60 to 70% normal. So when we start off with 20 to 30 eggs, after the genetic testing, we hope to end up with somewhere between four and eight, three and six genetically normal embryos for, for our transfers. The genetic testing also tells us the gender. So you will find out how many normal male embryos, how many normal female embryos we have. So you can make that selection when we're ready for a transfer. Step number four is selection of your surrogate. And most surrogacy agencies today will ask, will ask the same love this question. Most I wait to match you with the surrogate until you have embryos created. Five to 10 years ago, um, we used to never start creating embryos until we had a surrogate ready and synchronized to allow for fresh embryo transfer. But today in high quality IVF labs, pregnancy rates with thought frozen embryos are the same as fresh. So we usually create embryos, freeze them, and then you're matched with the surrogate. And your surrogacy agency will present you with profiles of surrogate mothers. You select the surrogate mother that you feel most comfortable with. She will then come to me to complete her medical screening. And I'm going to review her prior pregnancy records, her past med medical records, do a physical exam, uterine evaluation, um, before I approve her for surrogacy. So my goal is to make sure she's gonna provide this perfect environment for getting you pregnant and for carrying the pregnancy to term. Once she's medically cleared, the lawyers complete the contracts. And then once we get legal clearance, we'll plan the frozen embryo transfer into the surrogate. So you will tell me whether you wanna transfer one or two embryos. And most of the time today, we're, we're doing a single embryo transfer to avoid a twin pregnancy, which is a high risk pregnancy. But I do have patients that really hope for twins and we can transfer 
up to two embryos. The surrogate's treatment uh, involves giving her hormones, estrogen for two weeks, followed by estrogen and progesterone to make her lining receptive. And there's a very narrow window of implantation during which her uter uterus will accept that embryo uh, for attachment. So on that, on that specific day, we'll thaw one or two embryos. I load it into a narrow catheter and I pass that catheter through the cervix into the uterus, non-surgical, not painful. Um, and 10 days later, hopefully we'll have a positive pregnancy test. And we follow the surrogate during the early pregnancy until about eight to 10 weeks of pregnancy. And then she will transition her care to her obstetrician, who is usually the OB who delivered her children. Um, so our goal is to really help make this happen in the first time. If it doesn't, we usually have frozen embryos remaining um, and we can follow it up with a, um, a subsequent frozen embryo transfer. Um, but it's really, we do all that we can to make this successful the first time. And the pregnancy rates are high because these are really the best possible conditions to start a pregnancy. We have eggs from a healthy young egg donor. We usually do genetic testing, so we know that it's genetically normal. And we're putting this tested embryo into this perfect environment that the surrogate's providing, you know? So we, we can't lose, right? And I have a wonderful team of uh, staff members around me, of amazing nurses, embryologists, um, my colleagues at the egg donor agencies, surrogacy agencies. We're all committed and we all work together to help, help, help you have a baby. So I hope that was helpful. And you know, when you're ready to start the process, we're gonna go over this whole process again. And um, that I think it's important that you have a basic understanding so that you are able to make important decisions that will need to be made along the way. So I think we're gonna turn it over to um, Jay and Danny to hear what happens on the surrogacy side. All right. Hi, I'll obviously, I was told I only have two, two minutes, so I'll make it quick, a uh, quick introduction about us. Uh, my name is Danny and this is Jay. We've been together for 24 years. And when we first met, we just knew we wanted kids. So we looked around and we did look into adoption, but of course, since we're a gay man, we did, we did what ran into issues and obstacles. So, but then when we heard about our surrogacy, we knew that was it, that's what we want. So uh, with that, then we saved, saved, and saved until we were able to move forward with the process. Um, and I remember when me and Jay first met our, our surrogate. Wow, within the first 30 seconds to a minute, we knew she was it. She was fun, she was bubbly, and the chemistry was just perfect. So we, right away we say, that's it, she's it. We want her to be our surrogate. Yeah, we met at a coffee bean uh, in Pasadena, California, and which is fortunate because she was local to us, which was another yeah. great advantage. And, and yeah, she was just a, an hour away. And we were told that she can't drive. She, was, she didn't have a car. But to us, it was a positive because just an hour away, we were able to drive her to every single OB appointment and be a part of that. So that was really amazing. And we really enjoyed, enjoyed that. Yeah, so every single... OB appointment that she had, either I was there in person or Danny was there because we were her ride. Yeah. So we, we never missed anything. So we were very fortunate to be completely um, in, engrossed in the entire process. Yes. And then like, um, and then when our boys were born, uh, of course this is pre-COVID, so we're very fortunate to, to be in there, both Jay and I. And wow, it was such an amazing experience to see and hear our boys for the very first time. I tell you, there was like tears and smile all around. I mean, it's just, there's no word to, to, to describe that feeling. It's just amazing. So I'll, I'll keep it short. So I will, now I will pass it on to Jay to talk about what an agency can do for you. So I think we'll go to the next slide. Perfect. Okay. So, um, you know, the role of an agency is crucially important. In, in this entire process, you know, as is the, you know, the IVF clinic, the attorneys, everything. But I kind of look at the agency as, you know, we, I like to describe it as, I always give an analogy, if you had a symphony orchestra, 
we're the conductor. We're kind of telling everybody to do what to do and when to do. We sort of coordinate all aspects of the whole process. We're in communication with the, the nurses um, and, and occasionally even uh, with Dr. Raylor. Uh, you know, if there's something that comes up or there's an issue, you know, I have his direct cell number. I just call him and I'm like, you know, which is kind of a nice convenience because uh, it's not easy having direct access to the, the doctor sometimes, which is another great reason why we have such um, a strong relationship with California Fertility Partners and Dr. Ringler. Um, so our role also is, you know, to, to match you to not only we have, we have our full egg owner program, but also surrogates, we are going to really help uh, with that process and help you find the right people to go through this process. But that also includes, we do a lot of behind the scenes things as well. Just the screening process alone, you know, with a surrogate, we're going to do a home visit. We want to make sure it's a safe, suitable environment for her to be carrying your child in. Uh, we review OB and hospital delivery records prior to sending them even to the clinic. Uh, we actually have two registered nurses on our staff. I happen to be one of them because um, that's what I did in prior life. And uh, so we understand looking at the hospital records, the OBG, OBGYN records, um, we're gonna know ahead of time if there's a problem. I don't wanna waste your time and money and our time and money and everybody sending a surrogate who's just not even gonna pass the medical screening process. So we as an agency do our due diligence and do a thorough full screening of all of that prior to even ever sending the surrogate to the clinic because you know we don't want you to fall in love with her and this is great and then she doesn't even pass that screening so we really try very hard to do that we're also going to do an insurance review on uh, whether her insurance was going to cover surrogacy or we need to help facilitate putting an insurance policy in place uh, we also do the psychological screening um, and this is all prior to ever showing our clients a profile you know once once we've made her available you know she's gone through anywhere from three to six months of pre-screening process uh, to be able to move forward in this process um, next is also important aspect is matching um, through the egg donor process we really think it's important and dr ringler touched on this just a little bit how it's very important that you're selecting the right donor because she might be perfect. She might be Ivy League. She, of course, she has to be gorgeous. Obviously, we're gay, so that's just a prerequisite. <laughs> but um, you know, she may not medically have the a, a high enough AMH. Um, you know, she might not be able to produce enough eggs. And especially if you're a couple that's going to split those eggs, it's crucially important that we want to have a donor who is going to give you enough embryos at the end of the day, because as Dr. Ringler explained, the numbers get smaller and smaller and smaller, and we wanna have backups, we may wanna have siblings, if there happens to be failed transfer, we want enough embryos to be able to really move that process. So we help you initially making those, those decisions um, and supporting you in that process of really selecting the right donor. You know, if you chose this donor and came to me and it was a couple and they definitely wanna split the eggs, but maybe she's a proven donor and she only donated like 15 eggs. You know, I'm going to recommend let's, that, that's very risky because we're probably not gonna end up with enough embryos um, down, down the road. The next part is referring to like insurance and the support that we give to that. Um, we certainly help, we'll give our suggestions and recommendations, but we always work with um, providers who specialize that in that. So we work with a company called Art Risk. They're one of the largest um, surrogacy insurance providers in the United States. We have a great relationship with them. Um, we work very closely with them as well to help facilitate to make sure we have the right insurance in place and everything is set and safe and you're secure uh, to reduce any kind of risk and liability. Um, and the same thing with the legal and escrow, we are going to refer you to attorneys who specialize in um, this particular law. You know, you don't want a tax attorney <laughs> drafting a surrogacy contract. Uh, so it's really important. And, you know, some people say, well, I have a friend who's an attorney, or sometimes we have intended parents who are attorneys. Yes, but we, we, we want to make sure we're adhering to the laws of the state, the family codes, every state is different. So we help with you um, matching to help build your team. Um, same thing with the medical providers, like we work incredibly closely with Dr. Ringler, we have a great relationship. Um, and then the point is talking about um, when, 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 
what, what do you need to be ready for when your, your baby's coming? It's a super exciting time, but there's some really important things that you need to be aware of. So what we do as an agency, we will also, we send you out a birth plan ahead of time and we give you points and guidelines. Make, you know, make sure you have a car seat. Make sure you know how to use it. Make sure it's installed uh, because the hospital will not discharge your baby to you until they see that car seat, they see it's in your car and you know how to use it. So, you know, practice, use a stuffed animal. How does it work? You know, I know it sounds silly, but We've done that. you'd be surprised, um, you know, People don't think of those small little tiny details. You know, make sure we, we help with your getting your pre-birth orders. So we have extra copies of them. You have a copy of that. So when you go to the hospital, you know, there's no emergencies where the hospital says, wait, we, we, you know, what, what are you talking about? You're the parents, but she's carrying the baby. You know, we wanna make sure everything is smooth and easy um, as much as possible for you. So we, we help prepare you for you know, the arrival of your baby and safety as well. We want, we, we give you pointers on, you know, what is the safe thing to do uh, to make sure that your, your baby is safe, you know, such as babies when they're first born, you know, you want to have them sleeping um, on their backs, not face down. You never ever want to sleep with your baby in your bed with you because somebody could accidentally roll and turn and some, so the baby could be suffocated. You know, so there's important issues, safety. We help with all of that. We want to prepare you and make the exper experience as easy as possible, as seamless as possible. And we, you know, we want to provide you the most support from the very beginning of the journey until the very end of the journey, once you're home safe with your baby. And that's, that's kind of our role as the agency. So Great. Ryan. Thank you very much, guys. Appreciate that. Thank you also, Guy. Um, I'm going to open it up to Q&A at this point. We have a couple of minutes available for that. We do have some questions already, but if anyone else wants to ask additional questions, please use either the Q&A or the uh, chat section. So Heath and Carlos, this one's for you. Um, someone was asking about the financial assistance that you were able to receive, how much you got, got and then what was the difference that you had to make up for? So, so for us, I, so financial assistance for us was more in like the providers themselves, right? Reducing their fees, right? So there's, if you're familiar with the GPAP program at all, if you're not look it up, there's two stages of it. There's stage one, which usually provides nominal discounts somewhere between 10 and 20%, depending on the provider. Uh, and then there's stage two, which, you know, most of the providers provide some or all of their services pro bono. We were very fortunate to make it into stage two. Um, so, but even with that said, the reality is there's certain costs that you just, they're there. You can't reduce the surrogate's compensation. That'd just be cruel. You can't reduce the egg donor's compensation. There's just certain aspects of the journey that there's no getting past, right? So all in for us, we were about 90,000 for our journey, right? Uh, average journey cost usually is around 150 to 170, I'd say is kind of the range. So for us, it was a significant impact, but for anybody that's out there thinking, okay, if I go to this, it's not, you're not getting the cost completely wiped away, right? There's still, again, fixed costs, like surrogate compensation. And all that. So what I'll add is it, it's not all, like you need to give all this money upfront on the first day that you decide to have a baby. Right. That also, you know, cause obviously you need to have enough saved up because over the course of, of time, you need to, you know, pay things well, as you go. But it was, it did allow us to have, you know, our bulk of our, our savings there to support it. And then it didn't, uh, it didn't knock us out all in one fell swoop, you know, right. it, we were able to keep building and growing well, as we went along. Yeah, I think that's an important point, because the reality is you need a certain amount of cost to create embryos to get to that point in the stage. And really, if, if financially you are restrained, and perhaps you don't meet the qualifications that are required to be part of the GPAP program or anything like that, but you just don't aren't sitting on a boatload of cash, you can break it down into segments, right? You can do the embryo creation and then you can proceed maybe a year or two later, maybe you've saved some more money up with the actual surrogate portion, right? So I'd say that is sometimes for people who don't fall into the financial assistance category, a better way of examining your own journey. Great, thanks guys. A uh, couple more questions. Uh, this next one is for you actually, Dr. Ringler. Um, can two spouses, you talked about having twins before, can two spouses 
have biologically related twins, I, I suppose you say? Absolutely. At the time of embryo transfer, we make the decision of one versus two embryos and whose embryos we're going to transfer. We can transfer one embryo from each intended parent. And if there are twins, then you'll, you'll each have a biological child being delivered. Um, if you, when we transfer two embryos, doesn't mean we're, we're, we're definitely going to end up with twins. About half the time, we'll end up, end up with a singleton. And then you won't know, if you transfer different genders of embryos during the pregnancy, you'll be able to figure out who the biological dad would be. If you transfer the same gender, then you, you won't know until birth and you do DNA testing. That's exactly what uh, Danny and I did. Mm -hmm. So we had twins ourselves and we put in one embryo for me, one embryo from Danny. We were very fortunate. They both took on the first try, went to full term. We had a great experience. Mm -hmm. So our kids were, half brothers because they had the same egg donor but uh the two different dads carried together in the same pregnancy great thank you that's interesting um and then uh jay and Daniel will stay the next one with you what is the length of time someone wants to know from when they sign up um with an agency until they're actually bringing their baby or babies home so that's a great question okay, um one and that varies greatly depending on agencies so I'm going to give you same love surrogacy's time frame, but that certainly may not be the case if you work with another agency. We tend to be much faster than the industry. Um, there's many reasons for that, um, which you know I don't want to go into all of those details. But we're we're much quicker. Um, we're able to match surrogates much faster, uh, and also egg donors as well, because we have we are all full service program, so we can really kind of oversee the entire process, which is helpful as well. Um, so on average, it's about 15 to 18 15. months from signing up with us to baby born and baby in hand. I've done it in as quick as 12 months, but you gotta remember that's nine months of pregnancy. So, um, but on average, it's about 12 to 18 months. And, and we can add into that as well and just speak about our own journey, right? You are kind of as IPs, the driving force behind a lot of it too, as well. Obviously there's certain things like if your you know, embryos don't turn out great or you have an issue with anywhere in a bump in the road, obviously you don't have control over that. But when it comes to legal and stuff like that, really it's the IPs that are, and we were guilty of this, dragging their feet, right? So I think that you are your own best pusher of your own timeline in reality, right? And there's just certain things that, again, Jay already alluded to it. Nine months of pregnancy is just there, right? You can't avoid that. Can't speed that up. Yeah. And then yeah. <laughs> medical clearance takes time because the tests have to be done, everything you want to do. And that's for your egg donor and for your surrogate. So for us, it was 18 months. Had we not had that bump in the road where our first egg donor was it, didn't meet the AMH levels, right? That took up a little bit of time. We probably would have fallen closer to like 15, 16 months. But that's, that's why the 15 to 18 months, I feel like is a pretty accurate range. It's definitely for, you need to practice patience all around and it's good preparation for when you become a parent because that is the yes. ultimate test of patience. <laughs> <laughs> so true, so true. So I have another question here for the dads. Um, you talked about uh, that you're involved with the, still with the egg donor and even her mom. So someone's wondering, as am I, uh, how, is, how are they involved now with Jackson and how have you introduced Jackson and so it's a great question. I think, and I'll speak to how I felt when we initially started our journey. Uh, and Carlos is gonna go collect, know, he's gonna go collect Jackson, he's up. So um, with that said, I entered into this, I think maybe the way that some gay men enter into it initially, we had this perception of kind of heterosexual norms that are, we have our family, right? That's us, that's what's contained in our family. And I was like, that's maybe, I see that that's what I want, right? I want us to kind of just be it. but. After being in this experience and opening my mind up to it, I realized that I'm, I'm just doing a disservice to my child, right? If my child has more people in their lives that love them, right? They're gonna be better off in this world, right? And we, by default, as gay men, already create unique families for ourselves to begin with. So, oh, you coming? You coming? Come in. Say hi. Hey. Hey. Can you wave? Can you wave? Do you say hola? <laughs> We're also bilingual in the home, so we try to speak to him in both English and Spanish. Um, do you want to say anything? Huh? Do you want to give applause? Applauso, applauso, applauso. Nothing? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Right now. Well, you don't want to do that? You want to sit there. Okay. 
But yes, so the reality is just switching topics. This is the reality right here, guys. This is what we're all in it for. I mean, and he's pretty adorable. He's going to show you his belly. Ah! <laughs> and kick the computer. And kick the computer. Ah, ah he said. I got him. All right, there we go. What? You want to participate? But no, but this is the reality, right? And he's pretty awesome. He's pretty cute. Except for when he first wakes up, but maybe not. That he, that he gets from him. He yeah. sleeps really well. So does he. So does his family, as I'm learning from staying here. Um, but, oh, oh yeah, it's okay. okay. Yeah, daddy's so funny. <laughs> All right. Went and there's the real reality right there, guys, right there. All right. He's a talker. He's a talker. I wonder where he gets that. Uh, exactly. <laughs> That's true. So I, I think we answered the question. I don't know. I got distracted. <laughs> That's fine. So I'm going to put some, um, if anyone has any questions after this, we'll be happy to respond. I know Dr. Ringler and the, and the guys from Sam Love Sargacy will also be happy to respond to any questions. Just feel free to reach out to us at dadsatgayswithkids.com. Um, I, we hope that uh, every one of the speakers today hopes that, you know, you were able to get a real sense of what a journey is like through surrogacy and that we hope maybe you'll be able to picture yourselves going through a very similar journey. Um, if you need to, if you uh, have any other questions, we're going to respond to things. We're going to respond with an email shortly um, that will give you access to reach out to Dr. Ringler or to Sam Love Surrogacy. Uh, we're also taping this. And the webinar will be available, the video of the webinar will be available in the next day or two. And we'll email those to you as well. We'll give you some other links um, on Gays with Kids so you can find the whole learning center and curriculum uh, if you want to become dads through surrogacy as well and follow the steps one, you know, each the path each step of the way. So I want to thank our panelists again. You guys is all you're all great and really appreciate it. Hi Ethan Carlos telling your story like that. I know it really made hit home for us. Um, Thank you all, and thank you everyone for coming and joining with us. And uh, we appreciate you taking the time out to spend a, an hour with us. Thank you right. so much. Thank you. Bye, guys. Hey, thanks, follow us on Instagram. Ask your other dad. That's us. That's so, a great. I love that. I love that. Thank you. That took many hours in the car trying That's to figure right. out the handle. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, we ended up on that. So yes, we're also happy to answer your questions. If you want to just get an intended parent's perspective, we're more than happy. Okay. You want to be done? He says he's done. He wants fun. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Bye. 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 Bye.